Some of the hardest drugs in the world to get off and stay off are the stimulants. Although the deaths from opioids have really gotten a lot of the public's attention over the last couple of years, it's the slope of the overdose deaths caused by cocaine and methamphetamine that have really been just as alarming. Because they're drugs that we don't always think about you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of fatal overdose. Uh, so, so it's obvious that we're not just facing an opioid epidemic. New at five, more people are now dying from meth overdoses than heroin across Colorado. That's according to state health officials. News Five's Allison Zimmerman tracking the disturbing trend. She's in our Pueblo studio with a breakdown of the numbers. Uh, because the truth is that very, very few people who misuse and abuse opioids, you know, don't also use other classes of medications that when being used together, the combination can be, uh, Dangerous. What we do know is that in the last year or so, meth is becoming more common. Dr. Michael Nirenberg, co-founder of the Southern Colorado Harm Reduction Association, says in many cases, the people taking meth say they're also on other drugs. He believes more options to combat the problem are needed. You know, and, and the stimulants are a really good example of that. I talked about benzodiazepines in a video last month and how they don't get near the attention that the opioids do. The main reason for that is that they themselves, they themselves as a class, have a very, very low toxicity profile. But in combination with other classes, so like benzos in combination with alcohol or combinations with opioids, that can be lethal. You know, overdose deaths specifically from opioids, you know, began, I guess they began climbing about 20 years ago, kind of right after Oxycontin, you know, kind of came to the market and it sort of settled in for a couple of years. Uh, but that upward trend of drug overdose deaths, just overall drug overdose deaths, that has been going up since about 1980. So, so you know, for about the last 40 years. Uh, but the overdose deaths, you know, specifically from the stimulants like methamphetamine and cocaine in particular, they've been going up since about 2009. And, and the CDC numbers, you know, showed a tenfold difference going uh, from 2009 to 2019, uh, just with those two medications. It was, it was around 16,000 uh, for, for methamphetamine and, you know, around 16,000 for cocaine. And a whole lot of these deaths do and were caused by combining uh you know classes of drugs there was an article that i read in the international journal of drug policy uh it was two or three years ago and it showed that a huge number of people switching have been switching from heroin to methamphetamine for example because you know they started to figure out that the heroin was laced with fentanyl you know and and you know which is a problem because like there's a lot of methamphetamine products that have also been cut with with fentanyl uh and again, you know, just like with the benzodiazepines, uh, death certificates, you know, don't always list all of the drugs involved. You know, they're like notoriously problematic for doing that. Uh, they're not always accurate, you know, about, about which drug principally contributed to the mortality. And it makes it hard to know like the exact role that opioids and stimulants, you know, play in that mortality, you know, when, when people are knowingly or unknowingly taking these products together because most people think of someone on opioids you know as like the guy at the, <clears throat> at the subway station and he's kind of nodded out and he's just taking too much of that but the truth is that the majority of people who use or misuse opioids do not live like that you know they're they're doing other things they're working and they're living and they're taking care of a family and they're you know pursuing whatever like, other people are pursuing you know so it only makes sense to uh, uh for that person to then reach for something like a stimulant um, trying to offset those sedating properties of the opioids that kind of build up over time uh and i'm talking mostly here in this video i'll be talking about kind of cocaine and methamphetamine you know but of course like the most the most commonly used stimulants um, you know, would be nicotine and caffeine. Um, and they're all, you know, neurophysiologically, they're all basically doing the same thing, uh, but it's, it's a matter of degree, and it's that matter of degree that makes all the difference. And although all these drugs are being pursued, you know, for their pleasurable properties, you know, affect to one degree or another all of the basic neurotransmitters, uh, the the stimulants are primarily targeting dopamine. Okay, cocaine works specifically by blocking dopamine from getting taken back up into the nerve cell that uh, 
that first released it. So the concentration stays elevated for longer periods of time. You can think of you know cocaine basically as a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. That's you know that's essentially the mechanism of action. There's part of the midbrain that that when triggered uh, gives just this intense feeling of pleasure, and it's called the ventral tegmental apparatus (VTA). Uh, ventral tegmental apparatus, yeah, uh, and then nerve fibers from the VTA kind of go on to trigger a release in an area of the brain known as the nucleus accumbens, uh, the NA, nucleus accumbens. So that's kind of the basic pathway. Um, you know, from there, the person experiences the initial excitement that the drug user is going to eventually pursue. Uh, the problem with with cocaine is it's so short lived, you know, that you need to you find yourself having to need to do that every hour or two to kind of keep that that feeling going, you know. So this is part of one of the major brain systems that gets messed up in addictions, and and this the, this little pathway that I'm describing is called the incentive motivation apparatus. You know, like a few months ago, yeah, I think I did a video, uh, and, you know, I talked about the attachment reward circuitry in opioids well here it's mostly the incentive motivation pathways um, you know and just like with the opioids you know nature uh, didn't put this important system in place so that some random plant chemical can come by and activate it it's put in place for a reason you know for example for example with the incentive motivation uh, pathway, it is absolutely essential that there are chemicals that motivate and drive us to, you know, to eat and to procreate. Otherwise, no animal species would really last for very long. So that's why food and sex have to be kind of wrapped up in that, in that same dopamine circuitry, you know. So like when we have people who, who, uh, who kind of meet that diagnostic criteria for food addictions, for sex addictions, and we do brain scans on them, uh, those same areas of the brain are going to be involved. You know, it's also why the natural drive for procreation or even to eat, you know, could be completely suppressed in somebody who is severely addicted to stimulants. You know, dopamine is also why we tell people to avoid, uh, you know, to avoid the people, places, and things that are associated with your drug addiction for a while. You know, like those kind of rituals that get tied up with that activity itself can release dopamine uh, and it can start to release that stuff you know before the behavior is even engaged with you know for example somebody who's 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 quitting cigarettes you know, you know like let's say this person plays cards every weekend with their friends we might and you know and smoke cigarettes the entire time we might suggest that you do not go there and play cards for a little while because the association it's just it's just too strong right now and 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 the the card playing itself might be uh, you know, it just might be too hard of a trigger uh, to break if you're used to chain smoking while you're while you're playing poker. You know, I mean, like you ask anybody recovering from an addiction, and like they'll tell you that just giving up these like little rituals that are associated with the behavior, sometimes that can be just as hard as the actual addiction itself. Well, uh, you know, dopamine, dopamine is the reason for that, and. Uh, and dopamine has gotten a lot of attention, uh, you know, for a couple decades now. You know, like if you read like read any kind of neuroscience addiction type literature from say 1980 until about like 2010. Okay, so for those whole 30 years, all that you were kind of hearing about is 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 the pleasure principle associated with dopamine. You know, like it causes pleasure, you know, which leads to an endless pursuit, which leads to addiction. And you know, people just want to continue that process. But but a lot of research uh, over this past decade suggests that dopamine actually might be a lot more in the realm of desire <clears throat> than actually pleasure. And a whole lot of papers and articles have been written about it. Mark Lewis wrote a book. He's a, a neuro researcher. Um, he, he wrote a book, The Pleasure, uh, uh, The Biology of Desire. You know, did a really really good job of kind of pooling a lot of that information. He says dopamine uh, produces desire, like not necessarily satisfaction. You know, kind of like wanting, not necessarily liking. You know, so uh, like this theory, you know, with with 
with these stimulants, you know, like cocaine, for example, over time that it would produce an overwhelming desire to get more of something, but not necessarily an overwhelming desire to like what you've gotten, you know, which is uh, which is really what a lot of people with these chronic stimulant addictions uh, would would tell you, you know. So this is kind of bringing us to one of the biggest differences between opioid addiction and stimulant addiction, which is kind of like the purpose of this video. Uh, um, the opioids themselves operate almost entirely through a place, you know, through a um, uh, tolerance effect, okay, which to simplify a complicated pathway is an upregulation of endorphin receptors that require a higher and higher dose to eventually produce that, that same desired effect. And um, every system is subject to that same tolerance, you know, so the lung suppressing effects of opioids, the GI suppressing effects, uh, the, the pain relieving effects, the kind of pleasurable effects, all of this stuff all operates through tolerance the same way they all become tolerant together. Okay, so the opioids, you know, like they really don't become a huge problem, uh, on, you know, like unless you one that were to accidentally overdose on them, or two you were you were to run out of them, like you weren't able to get more. You know, uh, like as long as you, you know, for example, like as long as you have access to greater and greater qu quantities over time, and you can avoid. The overdose. Uh, like a lot of people can can live like that for um, you know for long periods of time. Now it can cause some liver and kidney damage down the road. You know that's all been documented. But usually at high doses for for really long periods of time. Um, but this is not the case with the stimulants. You know, so like, although the the kind of pleasurable part operates partially through that same upregulating those same upregulating tolerance pathways, most of the effects, you know, cause a whole different phenomenon, uh, which cause a ton of problems on their own. And this is what's known as sensitization. Okay. You know, the, the dopamine itself actually becomes uh, more sensitive in a lot of ways to, you know, the, whatever that stimulants is, uh, you know, so in this case, the like more cocaine, more methamphetamine, you know, which is where this is where the receptors actually become down regulated. Okay, so not up regulated, down regulated, and the dopamine has its effect at lower and lower doses. Now, if dopamine were primarily involved with pleasure, this would mean that you know people would just be feeling better and better at lower and lower doses over time. You know, which of course is not what happens. And you know, again, it is the craving, uh, but not the pleasure. That increases that craving, you know, that gets sensitized, and it's not just the craving uh, that's getting sensitized. You know, it is all the other little problems that start creeping in, you know, with these stimulant addictions, and they're all very well characterized in the paranoia, uh, you know, psychotic type features. These stimulants really are just one of the most, you know, lethal bait and switch products of all time. I mean, you know, that's why parents of like a stimulant addicted child, for example, you know, uh, but you'll hear stuff like, like, I don't even, I don't even recognize my own daughter. You know, she seems like just a completely different person to the little girl that I used to know. And it's like, yes, yes. You know, she is, she's, she has been self administering a product uh, that is making her desire more and more of it feel you know feeling very very little pleasure from that product itself and then re-aggravating and stimulating all those uh you know psychotic type features that are associated with high amounts of, of amphetamine so in that respect um in that respect yes you know she has become like a different person now obviously something like a methamphetamine can get you there can get you there quicker uh but you know things like the prescription and Prescription amphetamines can also do it as well, you know, so I mean so many stories about teenagers young kids started on amphetamines uh, You know that drug is producing the Desired effect, you know in the short term like whatever it is, you know, so maybe uh, Not acting out as much in class maybe staying more focused during baseball practice, you know, so you know, the the teacher or the coach who kind of made that recommendation well this person you know sort of looks like a genius uh, because they're only going to be there with the kid for you know one or two or three years uh, they're not going to be there 10 years down the line uh, 
you know, when this person is now having all sorts of problems. And I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not saying this is going to happen all the time, you know, but it just it is common enough, and I've seen it so many times that you know that it has to be talked about because uh, it is such a slow and in, insidious process, and 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 most people aren't aware of how sensitization works, you know. Uh, and this gets tied up with, with you know, one of the other dangers, uh, un- unfortunately, and it's a big problem, uh, you know, and it's it's a misdiagnosis, you know. For example, like that kid gets started on amphetamine, okay, maybe it's a 16 year old kid, you know, takes them without any problems for a couple years, uh, you know, somewhere in their early 20s, they're starting to have some, you know, some like emotional problems, some little things are coming up, uh, okay, so this person goes to see a psychiatrist or a therapist now they're in their you know mid to late 20s increasing amphetamine dose like this entire time uh now all of a sudden you know 10 plus years later they're having full-blown psychotic features the family panics you know they have this person committed the on-site physician who you know maybe just met this child or or you know, like this adult at this point five minutes earlier reads through their history and then concludes that this person's suffering from acute schizophrenia okay uh and now you get started on just one of the most powerful antipsychotic medications that we have and 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 that could change the trajectory of your whole life Um, i worked on the pharmacy bench for 10 years uh i saw stuff like this all the time all the time uh and a lot of times like in this example you know at the amphetamine was was not only not stopped, uh, it was never even mentioned as a potential contributing factor, you know? Like the science of sensitization is an incredible, is an incredible one, you know, particularly given that most people have never heard of it, um, uh, or at least, you know, don't really have any kind of understanding about it. Tolerance, on the other hand, you know, tolerance, everybody knows about. You know, one Percocet used to make me feel great, now I need five Percocets to get to that to that same effect. Uh, like I said, the opioids themselves are a textbook example of what tolerance is going to look like. Uh, but um, uh, but the stimulants don't don't work like that. There's this guy. Um, his name is Eric Kandel. He actually won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in the 2000, and he just did all this incredible research into sensitization. Uh, and he did it all on sea slugs, you know, uh, uh, of all things. But he also found that, you know, PTSD and a lot of trauma responses work this exact same way, you know, kind of getting sensitized to lower stimuli of, of, of something, you know, you, you know where, where a lesser stimulus evokes a stronger response. So when, you know, like Nietzsche's famous line, one of his famous lines of whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, not necessarily true, you know, not necessarily true in the context of, of sensitization. It can also make you more, make you more sensitized, you know, more, more sensitive, so to speak. Uh, this is why we could never use long acting amphetamines as a source of, uh, like maintenance treatment for stimulant addictions, like we could, uh, for opioids, you know, like, like, like we can develop products, long acting opioids, methadone, buprenorphine that we can give to you know to somebody to treat a heroin addiction an oxycodone addiction and we don't have to fear that we're going to sensitize the brain to these psychotic features over time you know but we couldn't give like an extended release ritalin okay to somebody who's suffering from a methamphetamine methamphetamine addiction uh it just it just wouldn't work like that uh but like everything like everything with with you know drug addictions it's just, this is all just an amplification of kind of normal processes that ha- have evolved over time to help us operate successfully in the world. You know, like for example, uh, we need both sensitization and tolerance. They're, they're both um, certainly necessary in certain contexts. Uh, it's just that addictions, you know, bring everything to the extremes.